going back to basics. Here's the program, in short story. Uh, I'm going to speak briefly about groundwater in the semi-arid um, west of the American West. Um, I'm particularly interested in climatic variability and how that affects the safe yield. Uh, the safe yield of aquifers is an important yet elusive concept, and then methods to calculate it with an example. What is the safe yield defined by the Department of uh, Water Resources in California about the maximum quantity of water that can be continuously withdrawn from a groundwater basin without adverse effects? Very importantly, this estimate is made over a climatically representative period, and that's a central tenet of this uh, lecture or presentation. Why bother with the safe yield? Isn't this all stuff? It isn't. The adjudication of groundwater rights commonly revolves about the safe yield. It is central to groundwater management as a baseline for uh, groundwater extraction, and as I will show in this lecture, the theory behind the safe yield is far from settled. What is a representative climatic period? It is such um, that it reflects long-term average hydrologic conditions. It must include at least one period of overall wet conditions and at least one of dry overall conditions relative to the average annual conditions have an average precipitation that is close to the long-term average precipitation. And very importantly, the beginning of the representative period must be an interval of relatively dry conditions for reasons that I will explain in a minute. Let's take a look at some data. Um, I'm gonna to be today speaking about a, a couple of aquifers, a small one in Central California in Santa Barbara County and one of the largest aquifers in the country, the Edwards Aquifer in South Central Texas. Notice that in this, this shows the cumulative departure of annual rainfall or precipitation relative to the mean, long-term mean. And I believe that is the, the proper way to represent um, climatic fluctuations. Notice that in that area, uh, going back to 1860, so we have about 160 years, uh, and then you can do some meaningful statistics there. Very long period, um, overall dry period, a quick recovery here of about 20 years, then a very long term um, declining drying conditions, then a wetting one, and currently what we call a severe drought. It hasn't ended um, in that area, um, in the Carpinteria Water District that I'm, I'm gonna be talk, talking about. Um, so notice that it is, it is not trivial to find what is a climatically representative period. It's very important to have these long term um, data sets, and I will uh, later on remark that it may take um, many decades or centuries to be able to make a, a meaningful assessment of this. Let's take a look at the other aquifer um, data set, uh, at least the precipitation is concerned. This is the Edwards Aquifer. Uh, it's one of the most productive aquifers in the country. Let's take a look at the, again, cumulative uh, deviations of annual rainfall relative to the mean, long-term mean. You can see, uh, very importantly, notice that when this data set started in 1934, we have about 80 years of data. Um, it started with a waiting period. That's very important, really long. Uh, re later on, we'll see that. Then it went into a very long drying period, overall drying. It recovered through a waiting period. And then who knows what's gonna happen next. Um, precipitation is extremely important because ultimately governs uh, groundwater recharge and that's central to the safe field. Now, <clears throat> I'll be speaking about two aquifers. One is a so-called small aquifer in uh, South Central California. My estimate is that the safe yield is in the order of about four million cubic meters per year. The other one is a larger aquifer in Texas. The other aquifer, Balcones Falls on. Um, there, we, I have better estimates on the order of about 400 million cubic meters per year. So an order of 100 uh, uh, fold difference in the size measured by the, by the safe yield. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, let's um, then take a look at more detail uh, at this. Um, a lot of my work has dealt with um, arid states, especially in the Colorado River Basin. 
I found interesting to show you here that in the average in, in the seven states, it's about 70% of the, of the developed water use is surface water. In about 33% uh, is um, uh, groundwater. Also, going back to the seven states in the Colorado River Basin, um, looking at the USGS data, about 81% average is devoted to irrigation and 19 to uh, non-irrigation uses. So irrigation does matter in the water balance. Much of that, and this was, some of this was highlighted last night in the, in the documentary, has, in the area where I live, for example, there has been a, a very pronounced change in land use from grazing lands and rangelands to um, wine grapes, which are um, dependent locally on groundwater, and it has, it has brought in tremendous pressures on the local water supplies. Now, again, going at a perspective here, this is um, regional aquifers in the United States. Let's take a look at the Central Valley, even though it's not the main one that I'm gonna be speaking about today. I found this a very interesting graph by Scanlon. They're looking at the overall change in uh, groundwater storage in the Central Valley going back to 1960. Notice that it is definitely an overdraft. That's another important concept here. The amount of groundwater uh, that exceeds the long-term recharge. Basically, this is an example where groundwater extraction exceeds the um, safe yield of the aquifers. And the question is, will, will the Sigma, uh, the California, so, uh, the Sustainability Groundwater Management Act, will that reverse that trend? Or will that essentially project to a complete drying of the aquifer? So another key definition to be able to develop my, my topic here, recharge, uh, is the water that enters groundwater storage, either naturally or by human action. This shows a, a box, that's groundwater storage, recharge, evapotranspiration, if any, and groundwater withdrawal artificially. I define this charge, that's essentially the water that runs off the aquifer to seas, rivers, springs, lakes, and wetlands. These this, um, definitions do matter a lot, how you define them. Let's take a look at uh, a cross-section of the groundwater, the small aquifer in uh, Santa Arbor County. Uh, notice the complexity of the systems. It has four layers. This is a stratified aquifer. Um, it has a reverse fault here that has sheared off the aquifer. Uh, this, there is seawater intrusion here because the streams have created gaps through the fault into the, into the bottom of the ocean. There's also severe faulting along the fault zone or, or, or um, fracturing. Um, Great difficulties in estimating the subsurface uh, inflow, which is part of recharge from the mountainous area uh, through the a semi confined area over here. And also, most of the private well owners refuse to uh, disclose how much groundwater they use, so it's very difficult to do the water balance with that. Um, but I think this is a very important cross section because it shows you that, uh, in essence, to be able to understand an aquifer, you have to measure. There's no other way than um, analyzing borehole logins and, and conducting pumping tests. Nothing else works. And if you think that other things work, you're deluding yourself. Um, let's take a look at the aquifer, uh, Edwards Aquifer, South Central Texas. He has a tributary area, a streams flow through the Gulf of Mexico. They cross the recharge zoning here. Um, the change of a stream flow in the stream as they enter and exit is matter, is meter. Therefore, recharge is seepage to the aquifer. And then the groundwater flows in a deeply confined aquifer. Um, that again, um, that gives us the recharge very accurately. Uh, a spring flow is meter, so uh, evapotranspiration is zero because the aquifer is deeply confined. So there is your system. In my view, the aquifer, the Ewers aquifer with 80 years of data has the best data set um, and longer than I've seen in any other aquifer in the world. So it's um, it's good to use as an example. Here is the data for that aquifer. It shows the annual recharge in blue. You can see um, then there is uh, a spring discharge which follows recharge with a time delay. And then groundwater extraction that leveled off in 1980 due to a variety of disputes over groundwater. Excellent data set. 
It struggles of the Edwards Aquifer is not seawater intrusion or um, la uh, land subsidence, but rather impact on threatened species in the aquifer. There are beetles, um, fish, salamanders, and aquatic plants. So there's more than aquifers than simply hydraulics. Uh, methods to estimate, if you have the data su such as in the Edwards Aquifer, then the safe yield is given by recharge minus discharge minus evapotranspiration. Very importantly, these are average annual fluxes. If these are not available, another way to estimate the safe yield is taking, again, average. These are um, annual averages. This is the average annual change in storage. Q is the groundwater extraction. It's an average annual. And in this case, the storage has to be estimated by exploiting the relation between storativity, the aerial extent of the aquifer, and the changing, hydro changing hydraulic head. If that data is not available, then uh, it is the so-called Hill method. One looks at the change in annual water level. These are annual values, not average annual values. Annual values. Plots that change in annual value against the groundwater extraction in the point where the change in groundwater level is zero. That gives you the safe yield. Uh, another way to do that is now to plot the annual change in groundwater storage. Typically, when the fluxes are unknown, you must use that relationship between storage activity area and hydraulic head change. You plot the point where the storage change is zero, and that will be your estimate. These are, by the way, for the uh, Edwards Aquifer, where the um, representative um, period was 1954 to 1989. I develop a method that relies on, um, if you know the capacity of the storage in the aquifer, that can be estimated in various ways. Then you can trace tangents to the, um, this these uh, points, high points in the curve of cumulative recharge, which is the sum of recharge minus discharge minus evaporation. And then those tangents must intersect the curve, otherwise the aquifer will, will not replenish. And the one that does that, that is your safe yield right there. C represents the aquifer storage. Here is an interesting, again, the Edwards aquifer. Notice the, the, the cumulative uh, change in storage. This is the maximum observed in 80 years. This is the minimum. Obviously, there's always uh, groundwater left in the aquifer. So by subtracting uh, this from that it gives you a uh, storage capacity of about 6 million, 6,000 6, million cubic meters. But then again, this is a lower bound, very important. So anyway, um, if you apply that method to the Edwards aquifer, you put your estimate of the uh, storage, you trace your tangent, which intersects the curve somewhere in here, and that gives you the safe yield. Uh, results, um, here I'm showing for the Edwards aquifer because the, um, the, other, the small aquifer, there are great uncertainties in the fluxes that I explained. So essentially, um, I didn't feel comfortable about showing you results about that one. In the Edwards, you, you look at uh, using the um, fluxes, uh, annual averages, uh, using this um, representative period, 459, if you use the entire period of record, it's 386, which is less. Remember that I told you that the entire period begins with a wetting cycle. Therefore, there is some um, refuse recharge. It, it does make quite a bit of a difference. Uh, the uh, change of groundwater level versus uh, extraction, these are annual values as opposed to averages. Representative period, 419. Also, this is less for the same reason. The storage versus um, Groundwater extraction, you can see the values in here. And then using the mass curve analysis, uh, that doesn't re uh, require a representative period, it requires the entire record. Notice that gives us a, a lower um, estimate because I use a um, lower bound of the, of the capacity of the system. So anyway, that's how it's done. And final remarks, to manage your groundwater basin sustainably, one must measure these fluxes. There's no escape to that one. Forget about grace and all these other 
it, it can be done. You, you have to have field measurements. Measurement the aquifer, store activity, it's particularly important, thickness, areas of the aquifers. If that is unknown, you're shooting in the dark. It may take decades or centuries in these climatically variable regions to ascertain the safe yield. Finally, groundwater management must be adaptive to climatic conditions. That's a whole other lecture, I'm not gonna expand on that, but essentially, the safe yield is a baseline. As climatic conditions change to droughts, you must adaptively adjust for that. When there is more groundwater available, recharge it to something else. So safe yield is a baseline, but a very important one. Thank you. Great, thank you for your presentation. I was interested in your use of the Edwards Aquifer because um, it looked like the 1954 period when you started it, it was a gigantic ramp up and recharge. And, and looking at uh, what's probably happened recently in 2015, 2016, with a recharge in the eastern area of the aquifer, I, I was wondering, have you looked at the, the data with the flooding in the last two years? Are we gonna start a higher base? And so if I was going to do a climatic uh, sustainable yield going forward, would I have a higher than the 2000? Is that, uh, is that for the Edwards there? Um, this is the, the departures of climatic data, but I right. can also show you the groundwater, cumulative groundwater storage if you want to see that again, which is um, this one right here. Right. This is uh, deviations of cumulative uh, so you changes. So started that minus two, two, five, two, yeah, this, this is the, the end of the historical drought that you refer to. Right, so but then how about, where are we now with all the flooding in East? In um, that data hasn't been released yet. Probably, uh, that's interesting. That's going to be probably a, a blip right here, maybe a blip. But the question is, are we entering, or uh, notice that this, um, the other graph shows it better. This drying and wetting cycles tend to be very pronounced. So they take decades. Stuck. Yeah. No, I, I don't believe so. I, I think it's going to recover somewhat, though. Okay. Yeah. Time for another question. Yeah, I was curious since the Edwards Aquifer is a had the first sole source aquifer petition done on it. Was that the delineation of the aquifer and the aqu some of the geometries? Was that what you used in your study, or did you do that separately on your own? Yeah, the, the study, the Edwards Aquifer is being thoroughly studied for about 100 plus years. And so um, I did a work there for the US EPA, but um, the hydrogeology of that aquifer is, is very well known. The overall consensus is, I believe, that uh, the data that I'm showing here is within plus or minus 5% of actual value. So it's considered by the USGS as excellent data. So, um, yeah, I relied on um, all these recharge, these charges, all issued by the San Antonio office of the USGS. So, yeah.